Revelation chapter 5. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshipped. Let's worship today, for He's worthy. Let's pray, church. Father God, we are so thankful that You're worthy of our admiration. You are worthy, Father, of our very lives. You're worthy of every ounce of our passion, of our intellect, of our will. Father, You are simply worthy because You created all things, and because of your power they exist, and because of your will they exist and were created. Father, we pray that you would help us today to worship in a way that you're worshiped in heaven. I I pray that we would get a glimpse of the glorious worship, the enraptured worship around your throne right now, and that we would join in with heaven's myriad upon myriads of angels and myriads upon myriads of heaven's uh, hosts praising the Lamb that was worthy. But Father, we are sinful creatures. And Father, we're going to need Your Spirit and Your empowerment to do that. For apart from You, indeed, we can do absolutely nothing. So Father, I pray that You would be powerful in our midst, that Your Spirit would move at the preaching, the singing, the praying of Your Word, that You would energize our worship. And those who are here today that do not know Jesus would see what they are missing in the joy of your people as we worship you in spirit and truth. For the name and the glory of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to take just a moment to uh, welcome our guest. If the guys want to go ahead and come forward. If you're here today and you're a guest, we're very honored that you're here. And uh, we would like to ask you to do... Uh, one thing for us, and then we'd like to do one thing for you. We'd like to ask you to look on your worship bulletin on the right-hand side is a, a tab that you can fill out some information about yourself. If you would do that, tear it off, drop it in the offering plate when it comes by. Uh, that would be your gift to us. But we are very honored that you're here. And these guys standing here have got a gift package for you. And we would love to get that in your hands. We're not going to embarrass you or anything. But if you right now, if you just slip your hand up in there, these guys will get that in your hand up in the balcony as well. Just slip your hand up in there. Okay. All right. Thank you. You got that, Dale, back there in the back. All right. Thank you. Okay. It's a good place to be. Amen. 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 We are glad that you're here. I'm excited about being here. Uh, we, uh, I'm forgetting something. I'm having a senior moment right now. Y'all ever have those? I was going to do something. Yeah, yeah, I knew that. I hadn't forgot that. That's all right. I, it'll come to me. Uh, yeah, that's what it was. Just uh, do a little housekeeping. I was going to introduce our guest. That's what it was. That, it's all flooding back now. All right. Hey, if you are not been here Friday night, Saturday night, you have really missed some wonderful services, wonderful messages. We are in our revival, if you're a guest and don't know, and uh, our guest speaker this morning, this morning and tonight, at 6 o'clock tonight, you're going to want to be back as we end our, our three-day revival. But our guest speaker is Dr. Bill Cook. He is a New Testament professor at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, He's been teaching there for over 10 years now, and uh, he's also the senior pastor of Ninth and Old Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, a church of about 800, 900 people. 
most important, he's a, a husband, a father of three, and a, and a grandfather. He's getting old, just like all of us. But we are glad uh, Bill is here, and you're going to be blessed for being here today. So I want to go ahead and do that and get it out of the way. In a few moments, we're going to have deacon election. It's that time of year, and uh, the deacons, in a few moments, uh, Bill Moon will come up and, and tell you what's going on, chairman of the deacons. Uh, and we, we will do that. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we want to, first of all, tell you that the Brazil mission team, uh, at the end of the worship service, will have uh, spaghetti lunches in a to-go box if you can't stay for uh, Bible study, Sunday school, which we hope you do stay. But uh, if you want to get those and take them with you and, and have your lunch, and also at, after Sunday school, you can either eat here at the Fellowship Hall or you can take it to go. Uh, but they're selling spaghetti luncheons today in a fundraiser to help offset some of the cost of the Brazil mission trip that five people from Brazil, uh, Bel Air will be going on come September 25th. Very expensive trip, about $2,000 per person. So anything you can do there will be very much appreciated. Well, we had a, a great event here yesterday. We had the Southeast Regional Bible Bee here at the church. We hosted it, and we had several of Bel Air Baptist children in it. And if you're here and you're, you work with children and sometimes you, you think it's not accomplishing anything, uh, Brother Tony Brooks is going to come now and tell you uh, just uh, how well our children did. Yesterday was the first day I actually saw the Bible be uh, in, in action. Um, we give a lot of credit to, to Mark Moore and his family who, who hosted that, put that on. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the, they have a written test. They have an oral test. In the oral test, they have to say 20 passages to, to, to get a perfect score. In those 20 passages, I'm not mistaken, there's 117 verses or something about that. Like that. That's incredible. We had several perfect scores, I know, on the, on the oral part. They didn't miss a word. They didn't miss a, a, a tense. I mean, it was verbatim for what they've studied. It was just incredible. And we think we can't memorize stuff. We can. We just don't put the effort into it sometimes. And uh, probably most of us couldn't just stand here and just quote 20 passages. I would have a hard time doing that, I think. But 117 verses, 20 passages, that's just incredible. Um, and then they had a written test. They don't just memorize it. They have to learn it. They have to know it. They have to be able to answer questions on it from uh, background questions, you know, maybe where the book was found, what it means. They learned so much in this time, and it's a great family-oriented thing. Um, we did have, uh, I think, eight or nine participants from our church. Um, just to tell you who they were, uh, Donovan and Thomas Powell uh, were uh, participated. Emily and Kayla, uh, Alex Van Nice participated. Uh, Emma Hammer Hammer participated, um, and then we had uh, three of our students who actually placed uh, in the primary division. There's three divisions: primary, junior, and senior. The primary division, um, Elena Moore, had first place um, in our junior division. Um, Alex Moore had first place, and Logan Moore had second place. And then uh, in our senior division, uh, we didn't have any of our church that actually placed. But it was incredible. Uh, if you talk to some of the judges, just what they saw, uh, it's incredible what these students learned. So let's give them a round of applause. Yeah, on the way home from the Bible, B, D, D said, I could go over to eat at the Moore's house. They serve smart food there. It might help me out. <laughs>
Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, how can we begin to fathom your grace, your love, and your mercy towards us? Father, you give us so very much, and Father, you ask for so little in return. Father, you deserve the very best we can give, not only of our money, but of our time, of our talents, and Father, of our love. Help us to be the people you would have us to be. Father, transform us into the image of Jesus that you want us to be. And Lord, that we would serve you always with grateful hearts. Father, we ask now that you would bless the offering. Father, that you would use it to the building of your kingdom and to the glory of your name. And always may we worship you with everything that we have. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, the Word of God says, For you've been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. This is a moment in our worship service that we just want to slow down and be still before God. The altar is open. We invite you to come if you're led to come or if you want to slip out where you're at. 
where you're seated on your knees. Uh, you may be more comfortable praying as you said. That's fine. But would you join me as we just come for a moment in prayer to God? Father God, we still our minds and we still our hearts. And God, we just ask right now that you would remove from our minds all of earthly things and earthly thoughts and earthly activities. Whatever consumes us, whatever causes us to have anxious thoughts, God, would you remove all that and fill it with your presence? Father God, we who know you are living in a sin-cursed world. And we're reminded today that the shepherd and guardian of our souls, Jesus Christ, though he was sinless, as he lived in this world, was reviled and cursed and crucified. Father, he is the example for us to follow. God, a lot of us today are suffering. Some of us are suffering and we did nothing to bring it on. Father, I pray right now that we would look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, suffering its shame. Father, would we count it all joy today that we are have the privilege of suffering for the name of Jesus. And Father, remind us that salvation, when it's all said and done, is not about us. It's about the glory of Jesus Christ. It's about the fact that he who suffered and went to the cross is worthy of praise. He's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of total obedience. He's worthy of anything that you ask us to do for his glory. So, Father, as we enter into this time of receiving and hearing the word of God, Father, would you help us to die to ourselves so that we might live unto Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, during this time to drive a stake in the ground and help us to leave here more so than ever convinced that we have been crucified with Christ and that we no longer live in the life that I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who died for me. Thank you, Father for the old rugged cross. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for setting us free from our self-will so that we can live into the glory of the freedom of the children of God. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. On the hills are
It's good to be back with you this morning. Thank you for being here. I I hope that you're not blaming me for the storm that's headed this way. I came from the north and not from the south, so I'm completely disconnected from it. But I know uh, very much what you're going through. I was raised at Cape Kennedy, Florida, and so for many, many years we uh, experienced uh, hurricanes while we were growing up. And then for a number of years before we moved to Louisville, Kentucky, we're in just outside Panama City, Florida. And so we will, are praying for you, but we'll be away from you. I'm hitting the, I'm hitting the road early in the morning and, uh, and flying back, but we will be praying for you and trusting uh, God's best for you. It's always good to be here with you at Bel Air Baptist Church. It's exciting to always see the changes that are taking place and the way that the church is moving forward. I was showing... Um, pastor just uh, just a few minutes ago. You know, a few years ago I came and uh, Alan, the worship pastor, was a swinging bachelor. You know, he had a shirt unbuttoned to about right here. He's wearing gold chains. I, I come back and from out of the blue, he's got a lovely, uh, sweet wife, Dee, and, and, uh, and I was really anticipating uh, uh, several little Alans running around this, uh, this year, but uh, maybe you'll have me back and uh, Alan, uh, maybe next year uh, we'll see some Alans or little Alinas running around. We uh, we don't know. You know, there's a lot of camaraderie, I think, between our congregations. There's a, a number of ways that we're alike. I was very excited to see uh, the Gospel Project materials at your pastor's home. We're in week two this week of the Gospel Project at our church. We could not be any more excited about it. From the preschool up through our senior adults, we have a sense of momentum and a sense of camaraderie together. We're all headed in the right direction. And the reports after week one were just outstanding. We had grandparents calling us and saying to us, you know, we had our family over for lunch. My grandchildren were studying the very same Bible passages that we studied. We had a magnificent conversation together. We had single folks that uh, told me on the Wednesday night, uh, this past Wednesday night, you know, a group of us went out. We're talking together. We're all on the same page. We're studying the same passages. We feel like there's more continuity. We feel like an army that's, that is strategizing, a, a group of soldiers that are all on, the same, they all, all on the same plan moving forward. And so I think you're going to be very, very excited to see the quality of the material, much better than what they've put out in the past. And not only the quality of material, but the, the camaraderie, the cohesiveness that, uh, that you're going to experience. So we're very, very excited for you. You know, sometimes uh, a story captures in essence the truths of the Bible in a way that, that are very memorable. A Brazilian pastor from Sao Paulo tells the story of a mother and her daughter, Maria, the mother, and Christina, the daughter, that in a sense captures the essence of a story that Jesus told. Maria's husband died shortly after Christina was born, and Maria was a strong-willed, determined mother. Uh, She staved off all kinds of male suitors that wanted to marry her. She got a job as a maid and and went about making just enough money to to raise her daughter in a one-room shack in a village outside Sao Paulo, Brazil. Over the years, they were able to squeak by just enough of a living to to remain together. Uh, Dirt floors, uh, mud mud walls, a picture here, a picture there, a calendar there to kind of spruce it up, a pallet on one side of the room, another pallet on the other side of the room, a wood stove in the middle, and a wash basin off to the side. That was the extent of their, of their home. And yet Maria and uh, Christina had a wonderful, loving relationship. Christina, in fact, grew up into a beautiful teenage girl. Olive, uh, olive-toned uh, skin, dark brown eyes, dark hair, a, an infectious laugh, a, an outgoing, magnificent personality. And by the time she turned 15, uh, Maria had felt like the, the, the most difficult years were behind them. She had been able to, to bring together just enough money to feed them week in, week out, just enough money 
to clothe them throughout the year. And, and now Christine, at 15 years of age, is ready to, to launch out and to get her first job. But Christina was an inquisitive girl. She was quite beautiful and could have had her pick of almost any young man in the community. And, and the suitors were lined up waiting for the opportunity to marry her. And yet something about her rebelled at the idea of marrying quite young, raising a family and, and living in that routine, the kind of routine that she saw her mother live in during the years that her mother raised her. She often talked about going to the city and running away the city life. But her mother Maria would often warn her, you don't know how difficult it is in the city. You have no idea what it's like to try to earn a living in the city. You don't have any marketable skills. But her mother knew that she had one marketable skill. One skill that she could survive on in the city, which was the kind of nightmare that any parent could imagine if their teenage daughter ran away to the city. Maria woke up one morning to discover that her daughter had actually left home. She knew that she didn't have much time, so she, she gathered together her clothing. She got together all the money that she, could, that she could muster. And as she made her way toward the bus station to go to Rio de Janeiro to find her daughter, Christina, she made one last stop. She went into a little drugstore. She got into a photo booth. She took all of the money that she could afford to spend taking photographs of herself. She stuffed them into her little purse and off she went into the city of Rio de Janeiro to find her daughter. She went to every hotel, every bar, every hangout where teenage girls would gather to try and find a way to raise money to find the next meal until the next night. At each of these places, she would take one of these little pictures of herself and she would write a note on the back she would tape it to a bathroom window in a bar. She would fix it to a bulletin board at some low-class hotel. Day in, day out, week in, for the several weeks, she went from place to place until she had exhausted all of her resources, all of her pictures. She gathered her belongings together, got back on a bus, and cried her way back to her little Brazilian hut. Days went by, weeks went by, and months went by, and one early morning, a teenage girl descended the stairs of a Rio de Janeiro flop house. The vibrancy in her eyes were gone. The youthful vigor in her steps had dissipated. Her shoulders were slumped. Her feet shuffled as she made her way down those hotel steps. When she came to the bottom of the steps, she could not believe her eyes. She saw on the bulletin board a small white black and white photograph of her mother. Her throat tightened, her eyes filled with tears. She took that photograph off of that bulletin board. She looked at it, she turned it over, and there was a note on the back. Not much space to write, but just enough space to say, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, you can always come home. Maria gathered together her belongings, gathered together enough money to get on one of those old Brazilian buses and make her way back to her mother in that little Brazilian village. 
You know, Jesus told a story very much like that. Only instead of a, instead of a mother and a daughter, it was a father and a son. Actually, it's a father and two sons. It's in Luke chapter 15. If you'll open to Luke chapter 15, this morning I want us to look at, in the next few minutes, one of the most famous stories that Jesus ever told. You may never have heard the story of the Sao Paulo pastor from, uh, from Brazil about Maria and Christina, but I can sure assure you you've heard this story. We know it as the prodigal son. I want to entitle the title it this morning, Meeting Jesus in a Far Country. Meeting Jesus in a Far Country. You know, most of us are familiar with the story of the prodigal son, but we're really not familiar with the reason Jesus told the story. We're familiar primarily with the wayward son, but we're not quite as familiar with the son that didn't run away. But I want us to get the idea, I want us to get the sense of why Jesus told this story. Look with me in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 says, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Actually, he told three parables. A parable about a lost sheep, a parable about a lost coin, and a parable about a lost son. You know, the the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, they they teach us that the love of Jesus is an active love. That, That Jesus is like the shepherd that went out looking for the one lost sheep. That Jesus' love is like the woman that wouldn't be satisfied until she found that one lost coin. And the imagery behind it was to teach the lesson that joy in heaven is the result of sinners being found, of sinners sinners coming home. So he tells the story of the lost sheep, he tells the story of the lost coin, and then most famously, he tells the story of the lost Son. Actually, there are three people in the story. There's a wayward son, a loving father, and a hypocritical brother. Let's see what Jesus would say to us from this story today. I want you to notice with me in verse 11 and 12 a wayward son's demand. A wayward son's demand. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. In essence, what he was saying, give me what will be mine when you die. Two-thirds of it will go to my older brother. One-third of it will come to me. Why wait until you're dead? Give it to me now. In, In a sense, he was saying, I wish you were dead so that I could have my portion now. And then look in verse 13. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. You get the idea if the story unfolds, this guy had it made. He had a father that loved him. He had a father that cared for him. He lived on on what appears to be a a quite uh, luxurious estate. There are are servants and there's a plantation and and he had everything at his disposal. And you have to ask the question, why do people leave? You know, the grass is greener syndrome isn't reserved for just a small Brazilian village or a distant Palestinian community. The grass is greener syndrome exists right here in Gulfport, Mississippi. Why do people walk away from God? Because they think they have a better idea in mind. 
They think God is keeping something from them. They think that God is keeping from them that which would be more satisfying, that which would be more exhilarating, that which would be better for them. And that's what this young man thought. This young man thought, it's going to be better out there. I'm free of my father. I'm free of the constraints of his oversight. I can do what I want to do. I can go where I want to go. I can be whatever I want to be. A wayward son's demand. Give me what is mine. But I want you to notice, secondly, a wayward son's demise. The latter part of verse 13 all the way through verse 17. Notice where his bright ideas got him. Notice where his choices led him. Notice that rather than becoming everything that he wanted to become and doing everything he wanted to do, his life became an abysmal disappointment for him. So in verse, seven, in verse 13, he goes to a distant country. He, he leaves his father behind. He leaves the religion that he was raised in behind. He leaves his God behind. And he goes to a distant country, a faraway land. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, now notice the contrast. He took everything because it appears that he has no intention of going home. Notice it says in verse 13, he gathered everything together. He took his boom box. He took his platform shoes. He took his leisure suit. No, that's the pastor I'm describing there. No, he, he took everything that he had. And he goes into this, into this distant land and he loses everything. He loses his family, his children, his wife. No, that's not him. That might be you. That might be where you're headed. He started off with a skip in his step and a song on his lips. And now he is perfect fodder for a country western ballad. He began to be impoverished. He's impoverished not only financially, his soul is emaciated. His life is devastated. He is a long way from his father. So he went and he hired himself out to the citizens of that country, much like Christina. And he, and he sent him into the field to feed swine. That is, he's reached the bottom of the barrel. He's like the drunk drowning in his, in, in, in his own vomit. He's, he's, eating the, he's eating with the pigs in verse 16. He's feeding the pigs for a, for a, a Jewish boy. That was, the, that was as low as you could possibly get. How could he get any lower? And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving him anything. Notice he took everything, he spent everything, and nobody's going to give him anything. Because there's only one person that truly loves him unconditionally, and he's a long way off. But I want you to notice with me a wayward son's return. Look in verse 17. But when he came to his senses, that's the first step on the road home. You've got to realize you've lost your mind. You've got to understand that you've wandered away from God. You've got to come to your senses and look at yourself in the mirror and say, how did I become who I am? How did I get in this place? You can't blame your father or your mother or your upbringing. I remember I came to that conclusion. I came to my senses in Philadelphia at 19 years of age, traveling up the East Coast, trying to get away from myself. And I could not blame my 
father who had just recently died from alcoholism and cancer. I could not blame my mother who was living with my third stepfather who was an atheist. I had to come to the settled conclusion I was heading down the wrong road. My life was spiraling out of control. And I needed to find my way to God. So he begins to think, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. The first step on the road home is to recognize you've done it to yourself. You've walked away from God. The second is to realize that I have sinned against God. I haven't just made a mess of my life. That's important, but it's not most important. What's most important is that I have sinned against God. And a person cannot be saved until they come to the settled conclusion... Not that they've messed up their life, but they've sinned against a holy God. And I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm not worthy to be called your son. That is, he's not going to make any deals. Uh, I'll give up the lifestyle if you'll just not make me drive down the stake. I'll give up the lifestyle if you won't ask me to give you everything. That is, the man understands he can't make a deal with God. That God requires us to return from the far country with unconditional surrender. So he says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Now here's the third step on the return home. You come to your senses. You see that you've, that you've sinned against God. The third step is you've actually got to go to God. I got up in Philadelphia and I said to the two guys I was with, one that I had traveled there with, one that we had met and were staying in his trailer, I'm going home, I'm going to try and find God. So he got up and came to his father. But I want you to notice the loving, compassionate father in verse 20. So he got up, came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and and felt compassion for him. Notice the father doesn't say, where's the money? Where's the goods? Look what you've become. The father feels compassion. His heart goes out to his son. And so he does what no well-respected Palestinian father would do. He began to run toward his son rather than making his son come back to him graveling and groveling in the dust. He runs to him. He embraces him. He kisses him. And then the son begins to get into the the rehearsal of the speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father cuts him off. It goes in one ear and out the other. And he begins to to give orders to to his servants and to his employees. The father says, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his uh, fingers, sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf, kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. Why? For this son of mine was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. See, it's a picture of heaven. It's a picture of what happens in heaven when a sinner turns to God in repentance and saving faith. There is a party, there is a celebration in the presence of God. And so this loving, compassionate Father says, let the party begin. There there is absolute and and complete forgiveness. Uh, But that's not the end of the story. Most of us in church are very comfortable with the first part of the story. A wayward son's demand, a wayward son's demise, a wayward son's return. But in church, there is a kind of sin that's considered respectable. A kind of sin that's acceptable. It's the older brother syndrome. 
It's the danger of religious blindness. It's the critical disposition. It's the fault-finding, finger-pointing mentality that always knows best and never feels appreciated. It's the religious hypocrite who has absolutely no problem being nitpicky, fault-finding, super-sensitive, condescending, and doing it all under the guise of religious authority and spirituality. Jesus is telling the parable primarily to condemn those people. Remember chapter 15, 1 and 2, the Pharisees began to grumble. You can tell the religious hypocrite by the grumbling, by the murmuring, by the complaining. This man receives sinners and eats with them. So the older brother was in the, in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. There's a, there's a party, there's frivolity, there's enthusiasm, there's excitement. But that's not what church is all about. That's not what we want. That's not the way we do things. That's not where we've been. And so he summoned one of the servants and he began inquiring, what are these things? What is this all about? We, we've never done this. We've never been like this. He said, your brother has come home. Your father's killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. He became angry. He was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began to plead with him. This is the goodness and kindness of God. He goes out after the prodigal and he goes out after the hypocrite. So he says to the hypocrite, Come in, join the party. Your brother's come home. But notice his response in verse 29. Father, for so many years I've been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat. Notice his relationship with his father is not exactly the kind of relationship you would hope between a father and a son. He's seen it as one of servitude. You see, he's crossed all of the T's, he's dotted all of the I's, he's done all of the right things, so he thinks he has certain privileges that ought to be his. And these privileges have caused him to become embittered and resentful and hostile and arrogant and condescending and self-righteous. He says, you've never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. The father says, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost and has been found. There are three characters in the story. The greatest character is the father. What do we learn about God from this story? We learn that God receives sinners with open arms. You may be a long way from God today as a self-righteous hypocrite or as a profligate living a despicable life. You can both come to Jesus today. You can both find the love and the forgiveness of the Father today if you will turn to Him in faith and repentance. The second character is the younger brother. Much like, much like Maria did with Christina, God has done with us. He has he taken a picture of Himself, only He's 
he's put it in words, and the picture has as its subtext, no matter where you've gone, no matter what you've become, you can come home. But the way home comes first recognizing where you are, coming to your senses. Second, it comes to the realization, I have actually sinned against God Almighty. It's not that I've just made a mess of my life, it's that I've actually sinned against Almighty God. And then it's leaving the far country behind. It's, it's, it's taking up and going back with no intention of ever returning. It's not giving God a try. Well, I think I'll give him a try. Maybe, maybe I'll just see if he can put my marriage back together. Maybe he can restore my relationship with my children. No, you, you, you return to him lock, stock, and barrel. And then finally, there's the older brother. You know, it's, it's, it's so easy to become self-righteous. To become a complainer, a grumbler, and to be unhappy with the party that Jesus is throwing. But the story is for you primarily. The story is primarily that you can come in too. You can come home too. You don't have to be the kind of person you are. Jesus will receive you just as much as he receives the wayward. We're going to have a, a brief time of commitment this morning, an invitation. Our worship pastor is going to come and lead us in song. I'm, I'm going to ask if you'll stand. Our pastor and, and uh, staff will be here at the front. I'd like to lead us in a word of prayer. I don't think we'll linger long. That is, if you're looking for a church home, you would come during this time, speak to the pastor. If, you, if you've got someone or something that you need to pray about, you maybe would come and to, and to kneel here at the at the front and, and talk and, and, and deal with God. But, but let's, let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the most, one of the most wonderful stories that have ever, that's ever been told. It was told by Jesus 2,000 years ago in a, a dusty Palestinian village about a runaway son and a self-righteous son. And we pray, Father, in Jesus' name that this morning the Spirit of the living God would draw people from the far country, that people would come from a distant land, that they would come to their senses, they would recognize that they've sinned against, they've sinned against heaven, and they would actually go to the Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You come today if we can help you, minister to you, serve you. Draw me close to you.